We're not here to fool around. We're here to use our time to learn math. <laughs> Yo. Now you're really testing my patience, and I want that to continue. <laughs> We're here to learn. I'm here to help you learn. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in fact not down with the sickness. Diego Riz, how are you guys doing? Good. Now how many hydrogens do I have? I have <laughs> well, that was really unnecessary. So looking fo focusing in clearly on our must knows where we should be right now. So we've gotten through these first set of must knows with like this universe evolution, the idea of Big Bang, transfer of heat, and really this idea of what Bohr's model of the atom looks like as it relates to spectral lines. So at this point, we're all in understanding that, hey, uh, atoms have protons in the center along with neutrons, um, and they also have electrons kind of floating around the outside somewhere along the way. So we should be able to sort of count these protons and neutrons for a given isotope, which we're going to practice how we do that today. And then also sort of start getting into what's known as uh, nuclear decay. And now there are a variety of nuclear decays. We're going to focus on alpha, beta negative, and beta positive, which are different, and then gamma. Um, the other kinds of nuclear decay that take place are sort of beyond where we need to be. And the idea here is eventually what will happen is once we can balance these things out, we'll be able to describe sort of, okay, how is fission, which is what this decay idea is, um, compared to fusion, which is what's happening inside of a star. And that'll sort of wrap us up into this idea of like, okay, well, what is the nucleus kind of doing inside of an atom? Um, but to make sense of that, we really should probably talk about kind of what is decay and why does it even happen in the first place? All right, so when we talk about nuclear decay in uh, ICB, we're going to be talking about nuclear fission. And fission is different than fusion. Fusion would be building up. Fission is breaking down. So you can think of the nucleus as having these protons, neutrons interacting with one another, and it's actually a pretty complicated interaction. Um, but the neutrons are almost sort of a glue to sort of bind those protons together, which are actively repelling each other. And honestly, just the slightest little hint of instability can jumpstart a huge problem, where now we have... On the, a non-uniform uh, number of protons and neutrons, making it so it's basically in a reaction that is not going to happen. And so we tend to call these starting nuclei the parents, and then the um, ones that sort of break off once all this stuff sort of resets, the daughter nuclei. Now, why this happens specifically has a lot more to do with uh, the proton to neutron ratio, but also this stability force, something called the strong force. For us, we're just going to focus on the fact that it does happen. So when it does happen, you have to kind of ask yourself the question, okay, well, what is it going to do? Is it too big that it needs to break completely down? Is it just need to flip a proton into a neutron? Or is there something else entirely that's going to happen? And so we'll get there. But right now we're going to focus on the idea that there's three major types of nuclear decay, alpha, beta, and gamma. And with an alpha decay, you have a substance that's so incredibly large, it needs to break into smaller pieces or it will never be stable. And after about element number 83, I mean, technically 82, lead would be your last one, because bismuth has a half-life around, uh, I don't know, longer than the universe has even been in existence. So it is slightly radioactive. But after around 82, there is no set of number of neutrons you can have to stabilize the protons. And so all of those uh, atoms, or elements rather, will under, undergo some type of radioactive decay, specifically alpha. And if I show you what an alpha decay kind of looks like, we can start by looking at something like polonium-211 decaying into lead-207. And if I throw, you know, um, I don't know, 20 different isotopes out there, and we just kind of let it exist, you can see that slowly over time, due to random chance more than anything else, the polonium decays into lead. And what a half-life is known as is when half of the sample has decayed. And so after one, two, three, whatever it may be, half-lives, you'll start to see the sample is almost not radioactive anymore. It's sort of stabilized. And truthfully, we say that it's around like 10 to 20 half-lives that the radioactive decay has happened in such a way that it's no longer taking place. But what does it really look like in a single atom? Well, that's a little bit even more confusing. So when we see this take place, go from polonium to lead, um, what you'll see is that 
the specific nucleus that's sitting in place there has a, a ratio of too many protons in place. And so as it actually decays, an alpha particle flies off and then it becomes much more stable. You basically have a set arrangement of protons and neutrons that's in a much more stable shape. You can think about it as looking at this picture where essentially you see that you have an atom breaking off a 4-2 helium nucleus, which is essentially just two protons and ne two neutrons floating together in one package. And the daughter nuclei left behind is now incredibly stable. Of course, sometimes it's not about being too big, it's about having the wrong ratio. For example, too many neutrons is essentially too much glue on the nucleus, whereas too many protons is too much repulsive force sort of sh shooting the nucleus out in the opposite direction. And when this happens, we really just need to flip a proton into a neutron or a neutron into a proton, which is something we call beta decay, which I'll look at more specifically with you in a second. So if I were to take something like hydrogen-3, which will radioactively decay into helium-3, and we throw, I don't know, 10 out there again, or 20 in this case, you see these little blue particles that sort of radiate outward. And the same sort of process is happening, and we're slowly turning in from hydrogen-3 to helium-3 over a period of time. Now, this half-life tends to be longer. It's in the scale of years as compared to the polonium, which is in the scale of seconds. And with this case, you see this slowly start to decay. And carbon-14 does the same thing. So if I were to flip over to carbon-14, you'd see the same exact process when I put 20 on there. The big difference here is the half-life. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,740 years. And so this is actually how we carbon date things, is we see carbon-14 radioactively decay in nitrogen-14. And if we know the ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14 found in a sample, we could thereby date it, although after about 10 to 20 half-lives, you can't date it anymore. And that's because all of the carbon-14 has radioactively decayed in the nitrogen-14. But with the beta decay, with one sample in here, all you're seeing is that there's an ejection of two different pieces, one of which is actually an electron. Now, the other is a neutrino, and we're not really going to focus in on that neutrino, but you can sort of think about it like this picture. You have a sample that, in a, in a sense, has the wrong ratio of glue to the positive proton sitting in place. And so what it can actually do is flip a proton into a neutron, thereby changing the element entirely to a new element, but in doing so, it has to release that excess energy, and it does so through the use of an electron. So what's actually really weird about beta decay, and what we'll talk about, is that there's two different kinds of beta decay, one which turns a proton into a neutron, and one which turns a neutron into a proton. And as we look at that, you'll see right here on this one, we're flipping a neutron into a proton, and thereby we're going to release an electron. We tend to call this beta minus. Now, beta minus is the one that we'll really basically call beta decay. It is possible to do the opposite, like this one, where we flip, uh, in this case, a proton into a neutron. Now, when you do that, in order for that to take place, we have to release sort of that excess positivity. And the way that's done is through the release of what's called a positron, or essentially a particle that's the same mass as an electron, essentially zero, but with a charge of positive one. Both of these are considered beta decay. But beta positive, we're going to tend to call that positron emission, so that it's easier for us to distinguish, hey, this is where a positron got emitted. Most of the time, when I refer to just beta decay, we're talking about beta minus. Of course, there's one more I still haven't mentioned, because I said there was three types, and that's called gamma radiation. Now, with gamma radiation, we're always going to look at it in association with something else. So something might go through an alpha decay and release a gamma particle. Gamma is essentially just our way of annotating nuclear energy, because gamma has no mass and it has no charge. A gamma particle is essentially just pure energy. So when we have examples involving gamma radiation, I will say something like the following nucleus, or nuclide rather, goes through a beta decay and releases a gamma particle. So you'll always know that that's the case, and it's really just an annotation of energy. So let's review real quick. There's essentially three types of nuclear decay we'll look at, alpha, beta, and gamma. All three of them are going to be associated with nuclear fission, or the breaking of large nuclei or unstable nuclei into smaller daughter nuclei. Now, if that's the case, alpha decay will involve a alpha particle or a helium-4-2 nu nucleus with a mass of 4 and a charge of 2, aka 2 protons and 2 neutrons. In doing so, it'll make a much smaller daughter nucleus. A beta decay will involve either beta minus, where we're flipping a neutron into a proton, or a beta positive, where we're flipping a proton into a neutron. In either case, we'll either release an electron or a positron, respectively. And then lastly, the gamma decay is essentially just associated with another type of decay, in this case, keeping track of the energy flow. So lastly, let's go ahead and try some of these out ourselves. Now, I've loaded the key already here so we can just kind of walk through what's happening. Whenever you look at a nucleide, you'll see sort of the association with the daughter, and then sometimes there's a blank as to, okay, well, what else formed? 
And if that's the case, you always need to make sure that you follow the law of conservation of mass, which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Now, keeping in mind our top number is our mass and our bottom number is our atomic number, or what we'd like to refer to as charge in terms of nuclear chemistry, mass and charge always have to be conserved. Now, the left side's are reactants, the right side's are products. So if the mass starts as 211, it better end as 211. Now, the question is, well, how? And so you'll see the lead's 207. Well, we must have four additional pieces of mass sitting in place for whatever this unknown particle is. The charge started as 84, but now it dropped to 82. We can't just lose charge. So that must mean that there's a two associated with this particle. Now we just found out this unknown particle is a 4, 2, has a mass of 4 and a charge of 2. So we just found out this particle is an alpha particle. So here's polonium 211 degrading into lead 207. Sometimes I'll refer to it kind of with words, and in such is the case, an unknown particle does alpha decay and then forms thallium 208. What was the particle? Well, I gave you everything. There's your thallium 208. There's your alpha particle. So now we're going to work backwards and figure out okay, the mass was 212, the charge was 83. So we actually started with bismuth, bismuth 212 in this case. And with beta decay, it's not much different. But what gets a little tricky is you have some minuses involved. So with potassium 42, going through a beta decay, because we see that electron hanging out there, well, the mass is not going to change. So this new particle is going to have a mass of 42. What is going to be weird is the charge better add up to 19 because that's what we're starting with. So this particle is actually going to have a charge of 20. So we check our periodic table for the 20th element, and we find out it's calcium. So when potassium 42 does beta minus decay, it'll break down and go into calcium 42. And so you may be wondering, okay, what does a gamma one look like? Well, if we scan through and we kind of just look across the board, oh, here's one. Thorium-230 decays into radium-226, an alpha particle, and some unknown particle. What is it? So I run through and find out, okay, there's the radium-226, there's the alpha particle, and I find out the masses and charges are already conserved. So that unknown particle that we have left is a gamma ray, or essentially a piece of pure energy. Or I'll say something like thorium-234 undergoes beta decay and produces a gamma ray. I have to tell you, there's no way for you to basically figure it out on your own. And from this point, you have enough information to try practicing this on your own. Good luck.